I'm here at Curtin University in Perth talking to Stella. Nice to uh, eventually actually come to your studio, which um, is just up the, the path from my own office here at Curtin <laughs> University. So we finally got around to doing a studio crash. The, the first thing I wanted to ask you was, how did you actually start as a contemporary artist? Um, well, I, I guess at art school I, I was always interested in um, not, not only in the kind of uh, evolutionary architecture of the body and, mm. and I was really fascinated with comparative anatomies, insects and animals, how they uh, locomote, how they manipulate, how they become aware in the world, that kind of thing. But also uh, having having sort of studied those sort of alternate physiologies, um, I became interested in, in this idea that well, what happens when you uh, add some technology, uh, augment the body um, uh, with instruments, machines, and what, how does that kind of alter your, mm. your, your, your sort of operation in the world? And that, that was really the, the kind of premise for a lot of these projects and performances. So, you know, performing with a third hand, an extended arm, a virtual arm, a virtual mm. body, um, uh, performing with a six-legged walking robot. Um, all of those projects were really about this idea of, of altering, modifying the kind of um, external architecture of the body using technology. We, not, a, not only externally, yeah. but also sort of internally, you know, what happens when you insert an artwork inside your, your body uh, instead of simply attaching it externally. So uh, they were the kinds of uh, ideas that, that sort of um, led to the more recent performances. Mm. Did you initially start with the suspensions? Is that how you got into thinking about the body and its boundaries and its capacities yeah I, I mean it seems logical that I began with the like the physically difficult performances and mm. then the technologically complex ones and then finally into virtual systems and but it wasn't really like that oh, okay. I mean the first projects I did in art school were helmets and goggles that split your binocular perception mm. uh, the first things I did um, uh, after art school were uh, three films of the inside of my body. Mm. Um, then I, yeah, then I did a series of sensory deprivation uh, performances, which kind of f sort of led to the idea of increasingly uh, situating the body in more awkward. I did find a network connection. <laughs> <laughs> it's my phone. <laughs> my, no, my my watch. My watch telling me something. It's, it's your cybernetic extension <laughs> of uh, <laughs> um, the organizer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, in fact, there's really been an oscillation of concern. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, the the, the physiology of the body. Um, on the other, augmenting it with with uh, with different instruments and uh, and attachments. Mm. But then also this idea of um, performing in mixed realities um, so the body becomes this contemporary chimera mm. of, of meat metal and code mm. and biology technology and virtual systems mm. one of the uh, I was going to ask actually before I ask about the third arm um, how did you do the uh, the internal movies yeah well your body because we're talking about Quite early technology. Yeah, well, this was between 1973 and 1975. Yeah. So I made three films of the... I filmed about three metres of internal space wow. into my into the left and right bronchi of my lungs, mm. uh, into my stomach cavity and um, in, in, uh, into my intest, lower intestine mm. through the anus. So... Mm. <laughs> So uh, the body was, was kind of uh, probed 
um, through the mouth and through the opposite end of, end, end of the body. But I, I guess that made me realize at the time um, that the body was not this uh, sort of bounded yeah. uh, 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 sort of architecture. Uh, but that you can internally probe it. You had empty spaces. Mm. Um, and then sort of many years, 20 years later, uh, the idea for the stomach sculpture came about mm. uh, when uh, mm. the, uh, it was the 1993 Fifth Australian Sculpture Triennale had as its theme site-specific works. Mm. And so instead of a, a sculpture for a public space, I decided to do a sculpture for a private internal space. Mm. Mm. Uh, but that really, uh, without that realisation and without those internal probings of the body, which happened a lot earlier, that idea probably would not would never have, have occurred. Mm. Now, um, I see behind you uh, probably... When I went to art school in the early 1990s, probably the piece that I most remember has been associated with your work, which is the third arm. So yeah. what, what year was this? And tell us a little yeah. bit about the development of well, it. Well, actually, this, um, this work was, in fact, um, completed in 1980. Mm. Um, and um, it was based on, on a prototype um, developed at Wasseda University. Mm. but uh, with additional capabilities. Uh, it has a tactile feedback system for a sense of touch, a rudimentary sense of touch. Yeah. Um, uh, a wrist rotation, uh, a pinch release and a grasp release. Mm. Um, and uh, effectively, you, 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 you slip it onto your right arm. So it's a, it's, it provides an additional hand. Mm. Um, so initially this was just a, a visual attachment to the body yeah uh, but um, I did things like I tried to write with three hands mm. simultaneously each hand writing a separate word mm. uh, a separate letter I should say yeah uh, of, a, of a nine letter word I only learned two words evolution and mm. decadence I was going to say evolution as well yeah because yeah. they were nine letter words um, but yeah, like at the time, it was sophisticated enough to get invitations from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, mm. and then the Johnson Space Center in Houston to demonstrate the hand to the um, extravehicular activity group. Mm. So at the time, they were working essentially with um, uh, uh, with robotics that were using force feedback, yeah. and they were considering a spacesuit with a, a longer arm and at the end of that arm w would have been attached a, a, a mechanical hand. Yeah. And um, at the time they were only considering force feedback. Mm. But using a force feedback system it would have meant when your hand fatigued inside mm. the spacesuit, basically your mechanical arm would uh, would not be operational anymore mm. but um, this system uses uh, an EMG controlled uh, device so um, electrodes stuck on, 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 on in my case the abdominal leg muscles mm. so just producing a simple contraction um, which generates very little energy um, would uh, uh, would uh, trigger a motion. So, for oh, example, right. a grasping motion. Yeah. I would not have to contract my muscle again yeah. or expend any energy or fatigue maintaining that hold. And then when I wanted to release an object, I would then contract my muscle again. Uh, so so yeah. this was very energy efficient. Uh, it would not involve fatiguing of your own body. Mm. Um, and that was the interest at the time uh, with, yeah. with NASA. Did it, did it take a certain amount of uh, training to get you to control it in the right way? Because I suppose what you're essentially doing is finding new neural pathways for controlling the third arm through, for instance, a leg muscle. Yeah, it, it sort of... It did take several months. Yeah. Because remember, like at the time, and this was like in 1980. Yeah. I mean, I was doing this just hands on. Yeah. I didn't really know uh, too much about prosthetics at the time. I did do some sort of general research, 
especially yeah. about the Otto Bock hand, uh, which at the time was one used uh, for amputees, mm. but that was very limited in its functions and also not very sophisticated and essentially mechanical in operation. Mm. Um, it took me a couple of months uh, to, to learn. I mean, the dilemma was, of course, um, you've got electrodes on the right abdominal muscle, mm. electrodes on the left ab abdominal muscle, and you, you've got very little separation between mm. muscles. So in the case of the abdominal muscles, uh, to generate one muscle signal but not, not the other, because uh, then you, you, you'd have a situation mm. where the hand would want to go one way or the other one way and the other yeah. at the same time that wouldn't wouldn't happen so it took a little little while to and and initially it was kind of like the, a very linear process like uh, i would have to think now do i want my hand to rotate clockwise or counter counterclockwise mm. then i'd have to kind of locate which muscle i was trying to contract mm. then focus on that and eventually the the hand would move but you know, after two or three months of practice, um, it was almost intuitive. You, would, you wouldn't sort of think of the muscle at all. You would literally look at your hand and, and, and you know, you would yeah. go in the direction you wanted to go or you would open and close or pinch release. Mm. Um, so it, it did take a, a little while to get used to it. Uh, but the interesting thing was that it, 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 it was this sort of intimate interface. Yeah. Um, so it was your, the electrical signals from your muscles that actuated the, you know, the mechanism. Um, much like uh, how your body functions um, in, in getting your fingers to open and close via tendons connected to your flexor and extender muscles in your forearm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's how that came about and that's how that, uh, that process unfolded. But yeah, it, it did, uh, firstly, I was considering muscles like my pectoralis muscles yeah. or trapezium muscles. Um, but they were awkward because I couldn't easily attach the electrodes, you know, to my back yeah. myself, where I could easily attach electrodes to my thigh muscles and to my abdominal muscles. So mm. not only were those, and also to choose muscles that would not affect my hand when I was walking, for example. Yeah. Or doing other I stuff. I was going to say, because you, you know, you've then got to disengage those muscles in their normal yeah, you have to stop yeah. stop doing you know what you would ordinarily do, and, yeah, yeah. and you know to actuate the third hand. So it was really interesting to experiment uh, as to which muscles uh, would be most suitable, not only in terms of the strength of the signal that you would generate, mm. but also in terms of not interfering with other normal uh, functions. Yeah. Having said that, you know. Your, your, your normal hands are not sort of stiff like this all the time. And if, if you're walking, you know, your fingers are moving, mm. your, your arm is, 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 is swinging. Um, so, you know, there was also this realisation that uh, it wasn't a sort of a, an all or nothing mm. situation in terms of control. Yeah. Uh, it would be more realistic sometimes um, you, that your mechanical fingers or wrist was doing something rather than just just staying inert. Mm, mm, that's true. Mm. Um, how long did it take to fabricate? It took uh, four years, but wow. but yeah. having said that, it was I mean it was self funded. I yeah. tried to get the Arts Council twice to to uh, provide funding, but at the time. I wasn't successful, mm. um, so I was sort of self-funded, and that was one of the reasons it just had to be done. Yeah, a bit at a time, really. So, in fact, it yeah. was the funding rather than the access to technology. Yeah, the... I mean, uh, at mm. the time uh, in in Tokyo, Akihabara was mm. the place where you could get all sorts of components. I mean, all of these. Uh, switches, um, um, all of all of the circuitry, all, all of this stuff, um, 
basically was purchased in, in Akihabara. Mm. Um, the, the actual circuit board, though, not the components, the circuit board uh, was done for me by right. a company that actually was working on car motors at the oh, time right. in Nagoya. Yeah. Um, but all of this is hand finished. Uh, I cast the, the fingertips myself with resin. I messed up the first five casts, which really cost me because, uh, uh, you know, in, in casting resin, uh, I only realized it afterwards, but the temperature that the resin, when it was curing, was yeah. generating uh, damage to the sensors. Oh, I see, yeah. So, like, at the time, that was about $1,500 worth of ah. sensors that were were damaged and I had to be... Which was a lot of money back in 1980s. <laughs> well, for me, yeah, too, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. at the time. So, um, but as I said, it was based on a prototype developed at Waseda University. Mm. Um, I don't think I could have done this completely from scratch. Um, One of the things that I've noticed when I've been in your studio before uh, with the third arm is that there, probably a lot of people don't realise this, but there actually is a... A sort of a prosthetic human more more human like <laughs> hand that you had made out of latex I gather um, yeah this was cast from my um, own, own right hand yeah and initially you know oh, yeah. the idea was to cover the mechanism yeah yeah um, and and I even in a, in a in an earlier uh, um, one I even uh, made finger uh, 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 fingertips mm. um, using uh, quill, uh, you know, the, the material from, oh, yeah. uh, from a feather. Yeah. The, the quill material. Try and replicate the. Um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, they, they look somewhat realistic. Mm. But, you know, it, at the time it was. Uh, and, and also I did things like, well, I'm looking at my hand and, and it's not, of course the one colour, yeah. so I tried to sort of painstakingly colour it, yeah. but you know, you got into this uh, uncanny valley problem. Yes. The more you tried to make it realistic, the more creepy it became, yeah. you know, so it was more real but not real enough, and so you got this strange uncanny valley where... where mm. In the end, I, th I thought, well, if I'm going to use it, I'm just going to not pretend that it's some real yeah. skin, yeah. but that this is just silly. So I decided in the end just to cast a single colour, mm. sort of skin-like, but obviously uh, not exactly. Um, but, you know, the mechanism was so beautiful in itself yeah. that I just, uh, yeah, I decided in the end that... Um, the best way to do this was to um, was to leave it uh, leave it as it as it is, and um, yeah, this is more a, a little. It's a sort of a distraction, I suppose. But yeah, I think it's inter it, I think it's really great that you've actually kept. Yeah. You know, that as part of the uh, the setup. Yes. So this this has travelled a lot, hasn't it? Because it's I know it's been around the world, you know, since we last spoke. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, I guess the last 10 years it's been exhibited over, in overseas exhibitions at least once and possibly twice a year and like mm. last year certainly certainly twice um, and um, yeah it, it's become this kind of historical object really yeah unfortunately it, it doesn't seem that any art gallery in Australia is interested in purchasing it yeah um, I, and and I think this is a, a real problem as a performance artist mm. um, even though these objects are beautiful in themselves uh, they're considered as performance paraphernalia yeah and consequently they're not seen as um, artworks in themselves would you be happy to let it go though at this point since it's been with I, it well the, yes the I mean you get yeah. to a point where you know I had to stop performing with it yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, guess in the late 90s yeah um, I had a choice at the time mm. effectively either to replace 
all of the connectors mm. and a lot of the cables uh, and keep performing with it. Mm. Uh, but then that would have, uh, in a sense, uh, made it, you know, a renovated arm. Yeah. Or kept it as it is. And because I'd been performing with it anyway for, a, you know, for about 19 years yeah. in different performance situations, mm. uh, I thought, well, and it was sort of getting to the end where I was exhausting the possibilities mm. of performing with it. So those two factors contributed to me deciding, well, I'm not going to use it anymore. Yeah. I used it sometimes in, in like demos yeah. um, during a presentation uh, or connected electrodes to other people as a demo in a, in a, in a presentation. Well, it, ra it raises an interesting kind of, uh, you know, in a kind of a conservation ethics question, doesn't it? That, you know, as a historical artifact, it's... Uh, it has its moment in the 1980s yeah and to update it you know sort of interferes with the, the integrity of that historical moment to, yeah to i mean i mean i mean i mean you could be in two minds about that i mean japanese mm. temples are, are renovated yeah that's totally true. every yeah. 20 odd years I, I don't know i'm i'm sort of uh i'm maybe guessing a little bit on, on the time span mm. but uh there's, there's no qualms about doing that sort of thing I think it was a combination of, of both, you know, of, of uh, it would have meant really replacing a lot of the electronics and the wiring and the pins mm. and the connectors and all that sort of stuff, the switches. Um, but as I said, because I'd exhausted a lot of the performance possibilities anyway, and I was coming mm. up with other ideas like the, the extended arm and... and um, uh, I, I, I also worked on a virtual arm. Mm. So imagine uh, this was in 1992 at the yeah. Advanced Computer Graphics Centre at RMIT. Yeah. So imagine with a head-up display, you see a virtual arm that's seemingly coming from your body mm. and with a pair of data gloves. Mm. Uh, the right glove was the mimicking glove. So whatever I did oh, with right. my right hand, <clears throat> my virtual arm and hand would 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 uh, mimic, but the left glove had a gesture recognition command language. Yeah. So, for example, if I wanted wrist rotation, I would just do that yeah. with the virtual arm. Yeah. But if I wanted continuous wrist rotation, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> and the virtual wrist would continuously yeah. rotate. Yeah. And then if I did that, I could extend my virtual arm. So imagine the virtual arm is a kind of uh, manipulator in a yeah. virtual task environment. Mm. And I could even grow smaller hands on the end of each finger of the virtual arm, yeah. which meant that this virtual arm was a kind of uh, a fractal manipulator yeah. with increasingly smaller fingers yeah <laughs> oh yeah and you could uh, manipulate in and smaller and smaller virtual objects and and that was completed around 1992 yeah so you can is, see this there was is very this... early when you're talking about virtual spaces as well yeah you know yeah. that at the time it i mean i know virtual reality started to appear around about that time but there was no real kind of understanding of how that could be applied in any practical sense yeah. in a very different way from how we think of virtual spaces today. Yeah. You know? And, and the, uh, the uh, fractal flesh performance yeah. where um, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki and the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam were able to remotely access and remotely mm. control the movements of my body. My body was in Luxembourg. Mm. Um, I mean, that was in 1995, which meant we were using ISDN connections. Mm. So this was really the early sort of beginnings. Yeah. I mean, uh, the World Wide Web you know, doesn't happen until uh, later. Yeah. A and so, uh, yeah, a lot of, I mean, all of these projects and performances, because there is an interest in state-of-the-art technologies, are really gestures as to what was much more 
plausible, much more possible later on. Mm. Uh, and in that way, they're, they're actually quite visionary because they're trying to think further than what is actually practically possible. Well, and, and the ear project as well. I mean, yeah. you know, like the, um, the ear on my arm. Mm. Um, yeah, if I... The idea itself was in 1996. Yeah. Uh, it took 10 years to find three surgeons and the funding to, to do the first surgical procedures. Yeah. But I, in retrospect, I was probably fortunate that it did take me 10 years. Yeah. Because um, surgical techniques had improved uh, the plausibility of doing this. Mm. Um, yeah, in 2000 and in 2006. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, there's a real possibility that um, sometime next year, yeah. and originally it was going to be the beginning of next year, and now it's the middle of next year, but it may even take longer because these things, your intentions and your expectations... Yeah, if they always take twice as long as you think it's going to Well, <laughs> I'm working with a, with a group in the States yeah. uh, that uh, um, have a lot of experience in... Um, uh, DIY projects on mm. implantable circuitry um, and uh, yeah what seemed to be uh, it it pro it's proving more difficult for them right okay. uh, and also we're trying to uh, raise some additional funding to try to make these components even smaller because the chip itself yeah. You know, it's going to be, you know, a couple of centimetres yeah. um, uh, square and uh, that's got to have to incorporate a small microphone. Um, so with you're staying with the original wire. plan to have it so it listens? Internet enabled, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the idea is not simply to um, relocate and replicate hearing but rather yeah. to make this into a remote listening device for people in other places so in mm. other words to inter internet enable the ear mm. um, and uh, yeah but it's it's taking much longer it's a combination of mm. of uh, uh, accessible technical expertise mm. um, micro miniaturization of components mm. And then the willingness of someone to do the surgical procedures yeah, that's right. necessary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's not easy to, to Where arrange. did you get the surgery done in the first place? In, in Los place. Angeles. Right, yeah. Uh, but with funding from a London produc production company. Yeah. So in the end, it was a media company that was doing a oh, documentary okay. on experimental surgeries. Yeah. And they initially got in touch with me to... Uh, to use footage of my internal body probes and yeah. my stomach sculpture. And at the time I said, look, you know, you can use this if you really want to, but mm. I really want to realize this ear project. Mm. And uh, if you guys would fund it, uh, then you'd have some uh, original project that mm. you would document uh, mm. as your own. Um, That's quite a creative way of actually getting it funded as well. Well, it was the uh, in the end, it was the only way. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, of course, it still proved difficult. I mean, mm. the London Production Company was convinced that this is the way to go, but um, we approached a number of TV stations mm. um, who turned us down, mm. and in the end, it was Discovery US. Oh, okay. Uh, that 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 actually pay, paid for it. Yeah. When was that? When, when did you have that done? That was in 2006. Right. So the first surgical procedure was in 2006. And it's a, it's a, um, is it a, it's kind of a mesh, isn't it? You were telling me once that it has, yeah. it actually it's has a, its own supply of blood at this point. Well, it, 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 it grew its own blood supply. Yeah, there. yeah. So, so if you can imagine, a scaffold which is mm. sculpted to the shape of an ear mm. and this is a porous biomaterial mm. uh, called med pore yeah and then when you insert this sculpted uh, scaffold um, beneath the skin and you suction the skin over the scaffold mm. over a period of six months you have 
uh, tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. Mm. So the porosity of the scaffold encourages your cells to grow into it, to populate it, yeah. and, and therefore to integrate it with your arm. But also, as it does this, it grows its own blood supply. Yeah. So this is fully integrated. I mean, it's not something that you would d detach. No. But, of course, um, the, the description of the ear on my arm has been really misleading. Mm. I mean, uh, people describing it as an ear grown on my arm, as yes. if a little yes. ear grows into a big ear. Yeah. Or... Uh, that uh, an ear was attached to my arm, which is blatantly, uh, uh, you know, and medically, you know, not possible. Mm. It's uh, the same technology that put the ear on the mouse, wasn't it? That was the same, uh, the same thing. Kind of, kind of, but with the ear on the back of the mouse, uh, it was a, a biodegradable scaffold. Oh, okay. And that basically collapsed yeah. after after weeks rather than yeah uh, may have gone for a month i'm not sure but but um to, to we actually um in collaboration with symbiotica we actually grew a small replica of my ear mm. uh, using living cells and using a biodegradable scaffold but you can do this uh, about a quarter scale mm. but you can't do this full scale it would just simply collapse all oh, right yeah um so this is kind of a, a it's it's it involves tissue uh tissue growth yeah but uh because it's using a porous scaffold um it's not biodegradable but the porosity allows uh your body to integrate the scaffold mm -hmm.